The semifinals are now set. Man, how good was that Germany versus Spain match from an entertainment point of view? Way better than some of the other drivel we were forced to watch, eh? Hope you guys are doing well. I missed you yesterday, but as I mentioned in a previous video, I was away at an event. But enough of that. Who cares? Let's go. And this was the match that I really wanted to see, and I got to see bits and pieces of it because, as you guys know, I was at that event yesterday, blah, 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 but it was in a very rural area. So in the car on the way out there, my friend and I did our best to watch the game on my phone, but service was pretty spot. I saw how Tony Kroos was so, so lucky to play the entirety of this match without getting a second yellow, mind you. I mean, how didn't he get a yellow for the foul on Pedri after five minutes? That was crazy. Such a blatant yellow. And then five fouls in this match total. He shouldn't have survived even the second half. This was like a Casemiro match for him. <laughs> really confused how he didn't get sent off. Felt like the referees didn't want to be the dude that ended his tournament, given he's retiring, you know? The wrath he would face from that. <laughs> and then on the Spanish side of how did they get away with that, there was of course the Cucurella handball. Now, the first question that has to be answered was, was it a handball? Yes, of course it was. It does not matter if he was pulling his arm close to his body, intent, doesn't matter in the slightest here, just whether his arm was away from his body or not. And it was away from his body and it blocked a shot. Bonafide handball, no question. You have to do some major mental gymnastics to say that it wasn't a handball. Dude, look at Kukurea's face right after the handball. Even he knew he got away with it. Now, the big question or argument here is whether Fulkrug was offside in the lead up this moment here. Unfortunately, we won't know because they didn't show us on the broadcast whether they used the semi-automated offside system or not to check this. And there is zero communication from the referees, so we're all in the dark. So overall, based on what we have seen for sure, with the actual facts that we have available to us, the only thing that we know is that Kukurea handled the ball. Other than that, we don't know if Fulkrug was offside for sure or not. Looks like he may have been, but we don't know for sure. Anyway, Verts with a great goal, Marino with a stunning header to win it, Olmo with yet another fantastic performance, a guy who I said they should consider starting ahead of Pedri. Unfortunately for Pedri, that will happen. Poor kid, he can't catch a break, eh? Injured for the rest of the tournament. It's over for him, unfortunately. Spain advanced to the semifinals in spite of De La Fuente's weird substitutions that he got completely wrong in my opinion. They lucked out there, taking Yamal off for Ferran Torres in the 60th minute or whatever. Williams also coming off in the second half, that's a massive risk. As for Germany, I think that Germany is in a great place with Nagelsmann as the coach and with the young players that are coming through, that's for sure. Consider where German football was prior to this with Love at the helm, with Germany's performances in the World Cup and Euro 2020. Everyone was completely jaded and annoyed with the German national team, low in interest. Just look at the difference to this Euro. All of the fan parks, all of the viewership numbers, which are back at their peak, things are looking up for them. They will continue to build momentum leading into the next World Cup. And I know it's not a major competition, but the Nations League will be a good litmus test for them as well, as they will be in the same group as, well, Hungary again, <laughs> the Netherlands, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we'll get to see what this German team is made of in the meantime. Now, things to consider for the semifinal for Spain's perspective, of course. Pedri is out with that injury from Kroos. Carvajal suspended due to his red. Morata got a yellow from the bench, so he is also suspended. Lenormand is also suspended. Out of all of those, Carvajal and Lenormand are probably the biggest misses as Olmo has been incredible and will slot in perfectly. I have a ton to say about this Portuguese side, but as I was writing out all of my thoughts, it just became way, way too long. It would have made this video long. This section of the video would have been longer than any, every other section of this video. So I will save that for a separate video to come out in the next few days. I just transferred my notes over, so it's still there. Portugal and France, a match where Portugal had plenty of opportunities to win this thing and didn't take them once again. Whether it was bad finishing or simply wasting attacks by cross, cross, crossing into the box. After this match, Portugal had 154 crosses in Euro 2024, 34 more than second place Germany, who actually scored from a few of them. That's insane. Easiest team to defend against by far as they are still playing Santos tactics. He's gone, Martinez is here, and it's still the same tactic of just cross to Ronaldo at the back post. 
France, for their part, still haven't conceded or scored from open play in five matches, and yet they are in the semifinals of Euro 2024 as Darth Didier has reached his final form of terror ball. This is like the new version of Portugal winning Euro 2016 with only one match won in regulation. France is on course to have a nasty Euro win like Portugal, aren't they? I can see it. I can see it, man. They'll score one goal in the final from open play, and that will be the winner somehow. But no, I don't know if they'll get past Spain. I'll save that for the preview of the semifinals. <laughs> I feel for some of Portugal's players, such as Vitinha, who was, for me, the best performer at this tournament. That dude is incredibly press resistant, so good on the ball. Unfortunate that he was forced to play in a system where the only options he had were to pass to the fullback or winger and then cycle possession until they inevitably crossed into the box. Anyone who says I am lying again or am exaggerating, I invite you to look at those numbers again. This is all Portugal does, and it's a pain to watch as a Portugal supporter, especially when you look at the players out there who are so good with the ball at their feet, so good at combining with others with the ball on the ground, more than capable of passing their way through a defense rather than just cycling it to the wing and then hammering it into the box over and over and over again. This one, of course, went to penalties. Mbappe with another silent night as defenses reign supreme in this one. And Jerome Felix's penalty in the shootout going off of the post, that was ultimately the difference maker between these two sides. I gotta say, other than that penalty, there were some incredible penalties in that shootout. Top bins all day. That Nuno Mendes strike, Teo's strike to win it, absolute beauties. So like I said, Darth Didier strikes again, but I said it in the preview, I've said it all tournament long, Portugal can't break down a low block, so why would DDA play any other way? The blueprint to beat Portugal is there to see. There are no surprises from them when they set up like this. No reason to expect anything different. Portugal did have the better chances, a better XG, etc., but they didn't take them. By the way, speaking of XG, I only ever bring up XG as it's helpful to articulate the quality of the actual chances in the match, not the performance of a team entirely. It's supplemental to analysis, not the entirety of the analysis. And so, France and Spain will face off in Euro 2024 on July 9th in the semi-final. Southgate put out a lineup that I think most people would have been very happy with. Of course, Gehi was replaced by Konza as Gehi was suspended, but Southgate changed the shape as well. Back three of Stones, Walker and Konza, Saka and Trippier as the wingbacks, a midfield of Rice and Menu. Bellingham and Fodum playing as a two behind Kane, sort of. Lovely stuff. I think this is what they should have been playing with all along. Switzerland were largely the same as their previous matches, and that first half was as you would expect from these two. Switzerland sitting in a deep block, sort of feeling out England, seeing what they're made of. England dominating the possession, but not really carving out that many opportunities, or at least dangerous ones in the first half. It was quite the stalemate. Those first 45, not much to talk about. A big positive for England was Saka down that right flank, as he was fantastic and an absolute nightmare for the Swiss defenders down their left side. But for the most part, he was the best performer. Didn't see a lot from Foden, Kane, or Bellingham in the attack. Saw next to nothing from Switzerland in the attack, from that first half at least. And in the second half, Switzerland were a much improved side and they were getting joy by attacking down their right and England's left flank. Keep it away from Saka and Walker. <laughs> that was basically the focus. Keep it on Trippier and Ezra Konsa. See what they can do. And then it finally happened. A ball squeaked through the six yard box and Breland Bolo was there to sweep it into the goal right on the doorstep to put Switzerland 15 minutes away from making the Euro semifinals. They were knocking on the door all half long and finally got their reward. However, like I said in the preview, while Switzerland has played better as a team over the course of the tournament, perhaps not as much in this match, but England has the more talented players overall and they have difference makers. Bellingham saved them against Slovakia with that overhead kick. Saka to the rescue this time, just five minutes after Switzerland had gone ahead with 10 minutes remaining in this match. So like I said, Saka had been very, very quiet in the second half, pinned back at times, and simply not in the play at others as Switzerland were targeting England's left side of defense. However, he had his moment, going on a solo run, cutting inside along the 18, and then hitting an inch-perfect strike off of the far post and in. Fantastic goal from Saka. England back in it, and Switzerland heartbroken. They were so close. 
Extra time just as dull as other extra time, such as Portugal, Slovenia or Portugal, France. We saw a big stop by Sommer on a lethal strike from distance by Rice. But aside from that, there was not much to talk about in extra time for the most part. In fact, one of the more notable moments was Harry Kane going off injured. There had been rumors that he was playing injured in this tournament. His performance sort of spoke to that. But when he took a knock at the beginning of the second period of extra time, he went off promptly for Ivan Tony. And Tony actually was at the heart of England's turnaround versus Slovakia, so not exactly a bad option for England. Switzerland did have a couple of chances in extra time, such as around the 113th minute when Switzerland switched play and then quickly squared it. But Luke Shaw defended well to keep that away from Denis Zakaria. Then shortly after, a similar switch of play to Shar on the right side of the box. And the man, for about the third time in this match, match tried smashing a strike first time at goal and not even coming close just slow down dude take a touch from the corner Shakiri nearly scored an Olympico this guy was inches away from scoring yet another major tournament banger he's <laughs> king of those apparently then there was Vidmer at the back post he couldn't keep it down I'm um, Dooney testing Pickford from the edge of the box they were pushing they were all over England part of that could have been because of the wholesale changes that Southgate made all at the same time, a triple substitution that could have destabilized England a little bit and affected their performance. Who knows? So, to penalties again. Cold Palmer converts, Akanji hits a terrible penalty, but Pickford guessed the right way, so credit to him. And then everyone converted their penalties following that. So England ended up winning in the penalty shootout. Another close match for them once again, as England were close to elimination, and then some close calls in extra time. So very unconvincing once again from England, but again, they find a way through. So credit to them in that regard. Who would they be facing between Netherlands and Turkey? Once again, the way that Turkey set up their attack with Yilmaz playing on the right, Guler through the middle, and how they were so fluid with each other, would swap positions, it was beautiful to watch. And this match in general was an incredible watch. Once again, shout out to the Turkish supporters who brought the noise and made this match really, really enjoyable. I need to see a match in Turkey, man. I really do. It's on the list. Turkey were the stronger side in the first half. Netherlands had moments where they would roam forward, but they didn't really trouble the keeper at all. Our boy Mert Gunok was bored back there. Meanwhile, Yilmaz and Guler were causing problems as Van Dijk looked far from calm, controlled and cool at times in the first half. He was simply surviving back there, especially against Yilmaz, who was nearly turning him and everyone else inside out. Speaking of defender versus attacker duels, Turkey also did a fantastic job of doubling up on Gakpo whenever he was on the ball, sometimes tripling up. He would often have two or three defenders to get through. And on the other side, Steven Bergvine was not having any fun at all up against Kadiolu, the guy who has really been a standout performer for Turkey at this tournament and will likely be pursued by some big clubs this summer. He is another one of the Dutch contingent in the Turkish national team. But all of that talk aside, the cream rises to the top, and Arda Guler is an absolute star. From a set piece, the ball came out to him on the edge of the box, and with his weaker foot, right foot, it's not that weak by the way, he curled in a perfect cross to the back post for Akedin to head past Verbruggen. Man, there were multiple Turkish players at the back post, bad defending from the Netherlands, but also just a brilliant ball that took a few defenders out of the play as well, and a powerful header from Akedin. Beautiful stuff from Turkey. So at the half, Turkey led, and rightfully so. And also at the half, Netherlands made a change to a 4-4-2 box formation, or a 4-2-2-2, if that's easier to picture, with Bergvine being replaced by Weghorst, Simmons moving to the right a little bit, but still kind of central, Gakpo staying on the left, and Memphis playing a little more on the left as well, as Weghorst had an immediate impact. Five minutes into the half, he headed the ball back across goal for Depay, and it would have gone in, but it was offside anyway, so Memphis spared of his blushes in a sense. But early doors, the presence in the box from Veghorst was a massive boon to the Netherlands' attack, plus what he would do to hold up play and allow runners off of him. But star boy for Turkey was once again at it, as Guler smashed a free kick on Verbruggen's side that bounced off the post. I think Verbruggen also got a piece of that. Then the pressure came from the Netherlands. They were relentless. They were balling out. Gakpo nutmegging people on the flank, combining with Xavi Simmons. A ball over the top for Veghorst to force a corner. And from that, De Vries had a free header that he made no mistake with, heading it straight down into the ground and past Gunok. So difficult to save those headers. Minutes later, and the Dutch were going ahead once again, thanks to who else but Cody Gakpo, the man who will likely win the golden boot, or was it? 
Started with good hold up play from Veghorst, then a great ball from Xavi Simmons over to Dumfries on the right, and an even better ball from Dumfries through the 18, and Gakpo was there kind of to help sweep it in. Just needed his presence as he and Mulder got their legs tangled, and it went off of the Turkish defender and in in the end. He would have converted it if the defender hadn't, right? Turkey came close to an equalizer in the 85th minute when a ball through the box was hit goalward, but Mickey van de Ven was there to block what would have been a sure goal. Close call for the Dutch, and another one in stoppage time as Verbruggen made a fantastic save to deny Turkey an equalizer. Maybe not as impressive as Gunok versus Austria, but similar vibes, incredible reflexes, got down really quickly, very, very good save from Verbruggen. And so, the Dutch held on to make their first Euro semi-final in 20 years, and I gotta say, Veghorst changed that match. And a shout out to Koeman for making the adjustments to the team that led to the comeback in this one, and book a match against England. Huge, huge compliments to Turkey, who gave everything and were so entertaining in this tournament. They were so close to tying things on a few occasions in this match alone. This was the best match of the quarterfinals, I think. Just as Turkey versus Austria was maybe the best match of the round of 16. There's a common thread there, and the future is bright for Turkey with all of their young talent. So, England versus Netherlands will face off on July 10th, and as mentioned earlier, Spain and France will play on the 9th. And I, of course, will have a preview video for you guys. My predictions, two out of four for this round. The two I got wrong were the shootout matches, so what can you do? It's a coin flip at that point. I'll take it. All right, I'll have that video out for you guys tomorrow. Love you guys. See you then.